pray. Lord Jesus, you look at us. And you know. You know that we are dust. And that it is to dust that we shall return. But Jesus, you know too that you have given your life, that you have come back to life, so that that is not our end, so that one day we will live again with you. But this day, this day as we begin this season of Lent, we come to you and we repent in dust and ashes for the times, for the ways that we do not live, that we have not followed after you, Jesus. So forgive us, Lord. Give to us the sweet balm that only you can, Jesus. And send your spirit to you, that as we hear your word this night, we would believe it, and that by believing it, we would become doers of it. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Lent is a season of confession, a season of repentance. It's a time when we stop, and as uncomfortable as it is, we intentionally remember, we intentionally remind ourselves that all of us, every single one of us, will die. After all, you have ashes on your head this night saying that very thing. But ultimately, the reason why we do all this is to get ourselves ready to look forward towards Easter and what Jesus will do on the cross and in the empty tomb in that moment. As the saying goes, Lent is about a time to clean house, if you will, to get ready for what comes next. But you know that. You know that. You've been here enough to know those sort of things, that this is what Lent is about. And so I want to ask a few questions. I want to dive a little deeper with you. One, would you say, is the last time that you really confessed your sins to someone. You know, not just a I'm sorry, or when they said it's okay, when would have that not been good enough? When did you confess your sins to someone so much that you needed them to say to you, I forgive you. When's the last time that God heard you confessing your sins to him in prayer? When's the last time he heard you asking for his forgiveness in your prayers to him? What about on worship in the weekend? We take a time to really stop to pause, if you will, and to give you the chance and the moment, the opportunity to really say to God those things that you are sorry for, that you repent of in that moment. But how often, how often is it difficult to not just focus, how often is it difficult to find the words to say? Oftentimes, even as I stand here, that's true for me too. Sometimes I struggle to know what to say, what to confess. Now, it's not that I don't know that I'm sinful. I know that. I recognize that. But sometimes on my worst days, and I imagine on yours too, I stand here and I don't feel like I know what to say. It's as though I don't have the words to say the things that I want to say before our God. And so for that reason, and for many others as well, we're starting tonight a sermon series called Honest Repentance. Honest Repentance. It's a sermon series written by a professor down at the seminary in St. Louis. And over the next Wednesday nights, we're going to be led to think about, we're going to be led to ponder questions like, what should we confess? Why should we confess? To what end? What is the goal? What is the purpose of repentance in our life as followers of Jesus? But tonight, we start with recognizing, answering the question, why confess? 
Because you and I, because all of us, have fallen out of step of God's perfect design for our good life here on this side of eternity. Let's back up, though. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We've been trained, I would say, by our life together, the way in which we speak to one another, the stories we tell, the liturgy that we practice week after week after week to acknowledge and to know that we are sinful people who are in need of Jesus' forgiveness. That's not new to you. You know that. But then why is it? Why is it that we struggle to know the words of what to say? Why is it then that sometimes we find ourselves only able to confess those things that we do week after week? Well, I was angry this week. Well, I was lazy this week. Why does it never go much deeper than that? What if? What if the problem was the way that we viewed God's law? If it was the way we viewed God's law? See, we're used to saying that the gospel is good news, right? It's good news of Jesus. But then if we label the gospel as good, what place does in that leave for the law, right? If the gospel is good, then the law must be bad, right? The law must be bad. And so then like a child who's being forced to forgive, we look at and we're led to believe that the law of God is then something to be avoided, something to be pushed aside, something that is there merely to restrict what we can do and, and put these unreasonable expectations on us that we know we'll never ever be able to reach and so we should just ignore it with all that we can. Sure, we might be able to try we might be able even to put in some good effort to conform to these unrealistic expectations. But if it's nothing more than that, if it's nothing more than just these rules and expectations, then we risk seeing it and interacting with it full of bitterness and resentment. Taken to its end, we might even ask the question, what's the point? Is it even worth it at all? But what if the law was good? What if the law was good too? What if it was meant for your good? What if just like a parent telling a child to not run across the road before they look for a car, it was meant as a healthy boundary for you? What if like the walls and doors in your house, the law of God was meant for your protection and your safety as well? What if God actually wanted the law to be the plan for you living your best life on this side of eternity? What if? See, the problem when we don't view God's law in that way, the best plan for life on this side of eternity, then the law truly is something that we should just avoid at all costs. But if it is truly God's good plan for us here, this side of eternity, then that changes everything. In the reading that Pastor Ben read to us from Ezekiel chapter 36, you should have heard a phrase that kind of hit your ear wrong. You should have said, well, that kind of sounds strange, Pastor. I don't think that's how it works. See, Ezekiel is speaking of this future beautiful day when God will sprinkle his people clean. He's going to take out their heart of stone and put in a beautiful heart of flesh. And what he's speaking about here is a sort of redemption. But then listen to what he says. This is the weird phrase. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to observe my commandments. I will cause you to observe my commandments. And you should be thinking to yourself at this point, well, pastor... That doesn't really jive. I thought that when we believed that then we were freed from the law, right? No. See, even after God has redeemed his people, they're not free to live however they want. They're called to live to the statutes, to the laws that he has commanded. See, freedom in Jesus is not freedom for whatever Freedom in Jesus is freedom within the boundaries that he sets for you and for me. And that, that boundary, that law, is what today is all about. 
you, you who have been redeemed by Christ the crucified, have come to receive ashes on your foreheads because you know, you know that you have failed. You've come here because you have come to terms with the very things that have pulled you out of step with God. And you are here to admit that you have done this, that you are like this, and that even while you were still a useless sinner, Christ came, died, and rose again for you. And so to live that out, we put these crosses on our forehead. But today we're going to do one more. 